Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel here at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis, Missouri. The text is Luke chapter 6, verses 22 through 35. The Reverend Dr. Rick Serena is preaching. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. We're reading from Luke chapter 16. Six, rather. Jesus said, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear a lot these days about how our culture has grown increasingly hostile to Christianity, how we should no longer expect uh, to be accepted by our culture or our values and ideas to be accepted by our culture, and all this is, is fundamentally true. But there's also a temptation for us in all of this. As long as we can castigate the culture around us, we may just mislead ourselves into thinking that somehow we are immune to those cultural influences. As if somehow we're on one side of a line and and the culture is on the other. But that's just patently untrue. In many ways, we are in lockstep with the world around us and all of its assumptions. We just don't always take the time to honestly and critically reflect upon how? This passage from Jesus' Sermon on the Plain in Luke reveals how, at least in, in one way, we are exactly like our culture, responding to the assertions and threats and grievances of our culture just as everyone else does. Now, there are all sorts of ways you as good Lutherans can approach this passage, right? You could say something like, Jesus is calling out the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Or maybe he's showing us the heightened requirements of the law and how short we fall of them. We could say the words of Jesus here do not invalidate or contradict the Old Testament law of retribution, the lex talionis, an eye for an eye. Or Lutherans, for instance, we've we've always acknowledged that there is nothing inherently wrong with self-defense or rightful civil government waging just wars and punishing criminals. You read it in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 and 3. Uh, the Augsburg Confession talks about it. Luther talks about it in his treatise uh, whether uh, soldiers too can be saved. Lutherans are not pacifists theologically. And we've never said that Jesus teaches pacifism in the Gospels. But if we're really going to be honest with ourselves, that's not our high-minded theological response to the gospel lesson today. In actual fact, it's more like this. That's never going to work. I can't see myself doing that. What Jesus says here is just downright unreasonable to our 
ears. It's difficult to swallow for us, at least as 21st century Americans. We're so proprietary and individualistic and obsessed with our rights and our possessions and our reputation. We are prepared, really, to hear what Jesus says. Rejoice when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse you. Give to those who beg from you. Do not demand a return on your investment business class would never. Don't be motivated by anger or revenge or greed or selfishness, but rather by the reward that your Lord has prepared for you in heaven. I mean, that doesn't sound like really good parenting advice, right? Would you give that advice to your kids? Our instruction is often just the opposite. Let me tell you, I've got six kids, and I am, I am an expert at giving terrible advice to children the bully punches you, what do you do? You don't turn the other cheek, you punch him in the nose, because that's the only way you get the bully to stand down, right? Don't let people walk all over. You have to stand up for yourself. Stand up for your rights. Love your enemies? No. Push back against them. Do good to those who hate you? At best, just ignore them. Try to avoid them. What Jesus tells us this morning may sound good on a theoretical level, but it isn't very practical, right? And it wouldn't work for us, not today, not in this day, and not in this age. And that's because, frankly, we think and act far more like our culture than like Jesus and what he tells us in his word. But your Lord's words are not quite as unreasonable or impractical as they may seem. Are they counterintuitive for sinful, selfish human beings like us? Well, definitely. Maybe, maybe that's, that's sort of the point. Jesus tells us to do things that we would never do left to our own devices. Yet they are the exact things, the exact things that Jesus himself has done and that he himself has done for you. Jesus did not respond in kind to his enemies in the gospel. He did not hate those who hated him or curse those who cursed him or abuse those who abused him. No, he died for them. He died for the Praetorian guards who struck him. He died for the soldiers who stripped him and placed a crown of thorns upon his head and a beam of wood upon his back. He died for the pilot who washed his hands of him and for the thief who mocked him and for the passersby who derided him. He died for those who salved his thirst with a vinegar-soaked sponge and who pierced his lifeless body with a sword. Though he could have called down legions of angels to defend himself, he didn't. He remained silent before his accusers. He died precisely for the people who killed him. He died not for the righteous, Paul says, but for sinners. While they were yet sinners. Sinners just like us. You see... We were not on the side of Christ before baptism. We were opposed to him, and we were opposed to him because of our sin. Jesus did not die for the sins of some really bad people way back when. You know, those abusers and haters and cursers and usurers in the Gospels. No, he died. He died for you because you were his enemies. And you hated him, and you cursed him, and you abused him. Yet he did not respond to you in kind. He did the exact opposite. He died for you. He was hated and cursed and abused literally to the death. Yet he willingly subjected himself to it all so that he might redeem you, so that he might forgive you, so that he might save you, so that he might give you a reward unlike any other reward to be found in this terrestrial sphere, a reward that will never perish, spoil, or fade, but is kept for you in heaven, where your true life, yes, your true life, St. Paul says, is hidden with Christ in God. And because of that, because of that, your reward as a Christian in this life can never be about revenge or vindication or selfish gain or self-justification. No, you do not live like the world around you that seeks these things, a world that has hope for this life alone and for its rights and for its possessions and for its reputation. But that, that's not you. 
You are citizens of heaven. You are aliens and strangers here. You are looking forward to a city that is yet to come, a city whose designer and builder is God. And that's why, that's why, while you wait for that city to come, you can rejoice when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil, no matter how counterintuitive that may seem. You can love your enemies and do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you and turn the other cheek as your Lord did before you, indeed, as Jesus did for you. And if he did that, and if he tells you to do it, then maybe, maybe it's not so unreasonable after all. Maybe, maybe it's just what the world needs to see from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Chapel. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about long and short-term opportunities to serve, visit servenow.lcms.org.